Hello everybody, welcome back again to Read and Reread. I am Angelia and today, here I am two days in a row because it's time to talk about the next batch of short stories. If you have somehow wandered into my channel unawares of the project that we are in the midst of, I am doing a 30 stories in 30 days for Shorty September project. I have a video where I outline the whole 30 stories and then I've been doing a video about each story after like about once a week and then I have the daily community post reminders of the story of the day so we are up to what is it this is days 13 through 18 so this is right in the center of the month batch and now the ones that I'm currently reading are kind of heading towards the last third of the month already I can't believe it so let's take a look at these stories. If you have read some of these stories, let me know in the comments what you thought about them or these authors in general, and or if something I talk about makes you want to read them or not want to read them or whatever. But let me know what you've been doing and if you've been reading some other short fiction this month. Okay, so the first one on day 13 was from this collection by Brandon Taylor, Filthy Animals. And he has also written a couple of novels that have looked kind of interesting to me, but that's what I need to know is whether the novels are better than what I read in these, the story. All right, no, it wasn't a bad story, but let me just talk about it. So I read the first story in the collection, which is Potluck. And it's the story about a guy named Lionel, who at the beginning of the story, he is on his way to a party and we find out that he's just come out of the hospital and we have to read on a little ways to find out that the hospitalization was for mental health and that it's not the first time that he has been hospitalized in, in recent months or the past year or two. And that he is a graduate student in mathematics but he is on a leave and maybe temporarily but he doesn't know. Uh, to work on his personal health and that he is working as an exam proctor in the meantime. So he goes to this party and he's very uncomfortable. He didn't really want to go. And it's, I was very interested in Lionel. I wanted to know more about him. I felt for him. I was really curious to learn more of his background and his story. And reading that this is a group of collected sto or linked stories, that was what made me interested about the rest of the collection. But, but, the other characters presented in this story were so, were so unlikable and unappealing that I thought, I don't know that I would want to read an entire book where these people factored in again and again and again. Maybe they get better over time. Maybe I gave more insight into them as well, but there's the host of the party. He's awful. There's a guy named, I think it's Charles. A guy named Charles. He says really inappropriate things and he's just obnoxious, but for whatever reason, Lionel's still kind of attracted to him. And then there's a woman that we don't get a whole lot about that Charles arrived at the party with but anyway it I just I I just didn't like the story that much I liked Lionel I was curious about him and I just my my takeaway was I I don't really want to read on about these other people unless something drastically changes in this story was basically to introduce Lionel so if you have read this collection let me know you know, if it's worth going any further. I, I'm reading so many good collections right now that I don't really have time to read on something hoping that it's going to get really good. If it if it if it's not really good all already right at the start, then kind of I have to cut my losses and move on. So um, I don't know. Or maybe I should read a novel by Brandon Taylor, but it just felt I don't know. It just it, it didn't work. It didn't work. Okay, the next one was one that I knew was going to work because I've read it before and I love it so much. And that was a story from Morgan Talty's Night of the Living Res. 
If you have been on my channel for any length of time, you have heard me mention this book before. This is my uh, one of my top 10 from last year. It is one of my favorite short story collections of all time. It just shot right up to the top. And you know I don't say that lightly because I love my short stories. But it is, um, this is, this is a collection of linked stories that you want to read all of it as soon as you read the first one. Um, last year I put the first one in the project and that was my introduction to Talti and then I just lost control and read the whole book and got off my schedule altogether. So this year I picked one a little further in that I wanted to reread. But if you've never read any of this at all, you might want to begin at the beginning. These are about a young man who lives on a reservation in Maine and it it moves around in time um, between, there's some stories he's a child, a teen, um, a young man. I don't think it ever goes up uh, past maybe 30 or so. And uh, at different points in time, he has different, uh, different things are going on in his home life with his family. And every, every single character is compelling. Whether you like them or not, you are in, totally invested in David, his friend Fellas, who is a priceless character, Fellas's mom, David's mom, his sister, his stepfather, like everybody in the story, you want, you want more. And it's also good. And there's just heartbreaking situations of poverty, substance abuse, uh, other other traumas and abuses that have happened, but it's also really funny. It's just so warm and it just makes it even more um, like alternatedly entertaining and devastating, depressing. Sometimes you're a little bit, you know, hopeful. It's just, it has everything. It has all, it has all the things. It has all the things. So the story that I read was, that I reread was, the I always forget the name, it has caterpillar. In a field of stray caterpillars. So it is on the occasion of David or Dee, as some call him in the, in the book, going to pick up his friend Phyllis, who is receiving treatments at a mental health facility. And he, first there's a long escapade where he cannot access the bathroom because of this janitor who spends forever in there and then he they they go and they go run some errands and they sit around at home so it sounds like not much happens but like so much happens and the title comes from an annual unfortunate event where there's just a flood of caterpillars and it is so gross the description of the smell of caterpillars that you are have no recourse but to walk through and the the mm, it it's indelible what and but yet i wanted to read it again so i just love this collection so much i cannot say too many things about it then the next one was not a new author to me but i have never read this story and it was the title story blood child by octavia butler now if you've read any octavia butler you know that it's it's going to be unusual it might be weird it's probably going to be startling and it is all those things and it is also so gross but i loved it so what I love about this collection in general, and here's one that I really wanted to just stop and just sit and read the whole thing, but the project marches on, but I'm coming back to it. Um, in this collection, she says right in the introduction that she doesn't even like to write short stories, but every now and then something comes to mind that basically that's the format it ends up taking. So here's this collection, and then she has an afterword after every story where she explains her thoughts behind the story, her intentions, inspirations, and she will just outright refute other critical interpretations that she has seen of her story. So if you went to grad school in the 80s, you might call out um, author fallacy, but uh, I'm, I'm, just, I'm gonna trust in Octavia Butler that the story means what she says it means. And uh, so I read Blood Child, and basically the setup is we're on another planet where people from Earth are called Terrans, and they live in a kind of a preserved community, 
And the people who actually are, I mean, it could be Earth and that the aliens have come and colonized here, but I felt like we were there. I need to look at her notes again. But anyway, there there is an alien race and they are not human. They, their description, they seem, I don't know if they're reptilian, but they have, they're big and long and they have, they have ar lots of arms and teeth and everything and they lay eggs and they have to lay eggs in a, in a living host to survive. And so there's this weird symbiotic relationship that has developed where the human population is protected by agreeing to give one family member to be a host. And you don't necessarily die in the process, but it's extremely visceral and painful when it is time to harvest the eggs. And it's, there's just a scene of an emergency harvesting that is really, really gross. If you're squeamish, maybe don't read this story, but if you can hack it, it's wonderfully weird. And I want to read more of the stories in this collection. I'm also, um, I was looking at a book at the bookstore the other day and I didn't buy it yet called, what was it called? I think it was called Wild Seed. And I think that's next on my list as far as her novels. So anyway, this is this was good. I loved this. Then we will go back into the past to read a classic that you probably read back in high school, which was The Story of an Hour by Kate Chopin. I read it out of this anthology that I've used several times. And it is, it is widely anthologized and online. I, I linked it... Um, on the community post uh, the day that it was that it came up I think I linked I think I had found blood child on there as well so if I find an online copy on the community post that's where they are um, but anyway the story of an hour and I understand why it's probably used so often in classes in English classes or in writing classes because it's very very short highly concentrated and basically it is it does take place over the course of an hour and just over maybe three pages where a woman first receives some terrible news and has an unusual reaction to it and then she receives some more news and has an unusual reaction to it that's really all I can tell you without spoiling the story but it was written in I think it was <clears throat> I think it was 1905 um, I'll, I'll double check that without stopping and digging through my book. It's It's got that punch. I can just see kids in class reading it and going, oh, you know, and just the first time that you read it. And I enjoyed rereading it and enjoying it all over again and just looking at how she managed to squeeze such exquisite details of description and emotional transformation into just a couple of pages. So it will take five minutes, 10 minutes of your time, take 10 minutes and, or maybe even 15 just to savor it or, and to read it twice. But it is well worth a few minutes of your time to read the story of an hour. Why do I holding this up like you can see that story? Go get yourself a giant old American anthology and read a, the story of an hour. All right, the next one was kind of a miss for me. And that was a story from this collection Allie, uh, by Allie Smith called Public Library. Now, maybe I picked the wrong story, and I should probably read at least one or two more stories before I call it a day here, because I really like the concept, is that the collection, it's described as, um, it says, what is the unraveling of our tradition of public libraries? So hard one, but now in jeopardy, say about us. The story in Allie Smith's collection are about what we do with books and what they do with us, how they travel with us, how they shock us, change us, challenge us, banish time while making us older, wiser, and ageless all at once, how they remind us to pay attention to the world we make. I love all of that. I love the concept that each story has something to do with a library. But the one that I picked didn't really, uh, you know, didn't do anything for me. And it was my first time to read anything by Ally Smith. And there's no particular reason why I have not ever read anything of hers, except that whenever there's a new book that comes out and it's described, it just doesn't sound very interesting to me. So I know she has some big fans. I should probably try a novel at some point, but it, it's just never called out to me. Um, 
so anyway, the story that I chose for no, well, there is a particular reason, but I picked a story called The Human Claim. And really all I did was I just kind of flipped through the book and what caught my eye was that the beginning of the story talked about someone um, was researching D.H. Lawrence and it, it brought up a memory. And the memory was that when I was an undergraduate and I was an English major, one time I took a semester long course in D.H. Lawrence. Now this is not because of my deep and abiding love of D.H. Lawrence. It was because it was one of my favorite professors. And maybe you remember that if you, I don't even think, it wouldn't have to be just English majors, but if you, when you're in your major or your graduate program and there's a professor that you just really, really like and you really enjoy their, the, the way they have their class and their personality and you like spending time uh, with them in their class, then you, you tend to want to sign up for their classes if at all, you know, unless it's just something so off the wall that doesn't fit in with what you're studying. So, but you, you, you kind of shoehorn whatever they decided to do in their seminar because you want to just take their class. So that's what happened. I took the D.H. Lawrence class because of the professor and the, the content was not entirely scintillating all semester long. I mean, I, I, I neither love nor dislike D.H. Lawrence. It was, it was fine as far as the reading. But um, anyway, it just brought back this memory when, when it, the beginning of it was about researching D.H. Lawrence. And um, so that was, that was part of it. It was about um, this research project, but also this other story about this woman um, having their credit card hacked by somebody that was buying um, plane tickets and things. And sadly, it just wasn't very interesting. The part about the... The hack and trying to weed through the bureaucracy was marginally more interesting than the part about the D.H. Lawrence stuff, but really the story was just kind of boring for me, and um, even though it was short, I kept peeking ahead to see how many more pages there were, so it, it was a miss. So uh, if you have read this collection and you recommend something else that I should try, let me know, and I can read that before I give it back to my public library, which I love with all my heart. All right, then the last one was one of my favorites, and that was the title story from Raymond Carver's collection, Where I'm Calling From. Um, uh, I love Raymond Carver. I love his short fiction, and I even love the book of poetry that I have that he wrote shortly before he died. And uh, this is actually not my favorite story, but it's one of his highly regarded stories, so I wanted to read it again. Now, I don't, I do love the story, but it's just not my all-time favorite. Um, I think my all-time favorites are, drum roll, um, So Much Water, So Close to Home, Where I'm Calling From, and A Small Good Thing. There you go. But I love, I love all the rest of them too. So Where I'm Calling From is narrated by a man who is at a, a substance abuse rehab facility. And he's there for his second time and it's the holidays. And I have this thing about, the, I don't know why I like these, but holiday stories that are not holiday stories. Like books that are set during the holidays but they're, you know, maybe they're just morose or thrillers or there's something sad or whatever. Like it's not, it's not a Christmas story, but that's when it takes place. And I, I, I tend to save them up and read them during the holidays, like Catcher in the Rye. And, um, oh, I'm going to read small things like these again when the holidays come around. So th this would fall into that camp of the, uh, Christmas or really New Year's story that isn't really uh, about celebrating. Although he does celebrate on his way to the facility by getting drunk on champagne in, in a car with his girlfriend all the way there. So, but just the narration, the way he flashes back to certain memories and he listens to the story of one of the other guys who, who's basically telling this love story about how he met his wife and they became, and they were chimney sweeps and this comes up a lot in Raymond Carver's stories this this act of 
listening and the narrating, the shifting over to another person's story and then just how it all kind of ties together with your original narrator. I like that structure that he frequently uses of storytelling and memory and then what is happening in the present moment and all that kind of crystallizing in a, in the short fiction. So that one, another winner. So I would say all in all, this was kind of a mixed bag of a week because it was two stories that I didn't love but the rest were solid gold. So um, we're kind of in the midst of the next batch. And so I will be coming back next week with another report on the next batch of stories. I hope that your shorty September is rocking and that you are reading some excellent uh, short stories or short novels. Let me know what you have been reading this week that you really love. And um, that's going to wrap it up for now. I'll be back with Friday Reads in a couple days. Have a great day. Bye.